Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Professor Zabine Schmidtke for a kind invitation, Uta for taking care of us, as well as Dr. Ansari for being such a great host. Um, in the 10 minutes that I have, or nine minutes, I would like to talk about a heritage site in the highlands of the province of Fars uh, in southwestern Iran. Uh, this site is actually next to the mountain range of Persepolis that uh, Alexander was just uh, speaking about. And let me begin with uh, a historian, uh, a medieval historian, Ibn Balkhi, who in his important Persian text, uh, the Fars Name from the 12th century, provides uh, importance of the site for the pre-Islamic period and then for the inhabitants of the region. It is important to note that while the text was composed in the Seljuk period, most of the Fars Name is dedicated to the history and monuments of ancient Persia. Ibn Balkhi may be a strange choice to uh, talk about ancient Iran, but it is a good evidence to demonstrate in the continuity of tradition from the pre-Islamic and what we call Islamic uh, periods. Ibn Balkhi points to a complex uh, which the locals call Kuhenifisht, as you're seeing on screen, or the Mountain of Writing. It is not uh, for certain, but it is probable that this place was synonymous with Dejenevesht, or the mountain of, or the fortress of archives. These are Chardin's uh, sort of drawings uh, from about four or 500 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, of the site, referring to what came to be known as the Cabe of Zartosht, or the Cube of Zoroaster as part of this complex. Uh, in time, this complex came to be known, as you can see, uh, the Naqsh rostam or the image of Rostam, which is part of the sacred topography of Iran, and uh, what I would like to discuss today. The large complex houses 2,000 years of material culture and textual uh, remains, and this is sort of a panoramic view of Naqsh rostam from the Elamite period, from about 1200 BC uh, through the Achaemenids, which Alexander touched upon, and the Sasanians, ending uh, with what is known to the locals as Tarash Khosro, this blank area, which is supposed to have been uh, a place designated for Khosro II in the seventh century after his great battle uh, against Heraclius. While we have a single Elamite relief partly remaining, there are four Achaemenid tombs belonging to Darius the Great, Xerxes the First, Artaxerxes, and Darius the Second. You're seeing these tombs here, at least three of them in the picture. Some of the old Persian texts accompanying the tombs are of specific interest and are quite unique in terms of their worldview representing the Achaemenid worldview. So just, I knew you wanted to learn some old Persian, so here's a passage. Marti ahiya aura mazda framana, hautai gasta ma tadaya, patim tadayam, rastam ma avarada ma stava. O man, the commandment of Ahura Mazda, the great Lord, let not that seem evil to you. Do not leave the right path. Do not be disobedient. So this is right next to the tomb. Uh, this is Darius' Naqsh Rostam A and B inscription in Old Persian. Uh, the next column also has this very long and somewhat of a unique uh, uh, discussion or sayings, which I just give you a part of it. Let not that seem the best to you which is spoken in your ear. Listen also to that which is said beside. So uh, listen to several people and just don't uh, take things for granted. Uh, this passage, to my mind at least, actually is inspired uh, to the words of uh, Zarathustra in his uh, sort of commandments in the Gathas, uh, uh, part of the oldest uh, part of oral Iranian poetry in Yasna 30, where it states, Sarauta Gaushish Vahishta, hear with your ears the best, view through the radiance with your thoughts. Facing this mountain, as I just mentioned to you, stands the cube of Zoroaster, uh, perhaps once a royal archive. Uh, and we think of this because in later Middle Persian texts, there is a mention that uh, during the time of Darius, uh, uh, he had ordered that uh, documents be put together. And it says one of them he ordered to be kept in the royal treasury and the other in the fortress of archives, this Deje that we already mentioned in the 12th century with Ibn Balkhi. So there's 
these connections. It is also possible that the far paranalia of kingship was kept there. And as uh, there are post achaemenid coin finds of these Fratarakas have been found in the region, representing the Persians during the Seleucid period. And we may, uh, some scholars believe that uh, the king would go into the uh, cube uh, and uh, we see the banner of kingship here, and then he would come out facing the mausoleum where the bones of the old kings are buried. Also in this complex, there are a number of Sasanian rock reliefs from late antiquity, third to the uh, fifth and sixth century, uh, and one black one that is attributed to the seventh century in this mountain of writing. Beginning with Ardashir, the founder of the Sasanian dynasty, uh, and it also has the first lines in Middle Persian as far as we know, and the mention of Iran in the third century on the breast of the horse. Uh, here's a close uh, trilingual uh, Parthian, um, Greek and Middle Persian inscription. Uh, this is the image of Mazda worshiping Lord Ardashir, king of kings of the Iranians, whose lineage is from the gods, son of Lord King Pafak. There's also a court scene of later kings, uh, jousting scenes. So it, it is really a, a sort of depository of lots of different traditions in this late antique period, but perhaps the most majestic of these inscriptions, or rock reliefs, I would say, is the rock relief of Shapur I, facing the Roman Caesars here. Uh, uh, Shapur, who defeated the Romans uh, in the 240s and 60s, didn't miss the opportunity, made lots of these photo ops, but the, the biggest one is really here, uh, facing this uh, rock relief in front of cube of Zoroaster, where, in fact, in the cube, he left the longest Middle Persian inscription telling us his feats and his accomplishments. So right across this sort of famous uh, rock relief, we have this inscription, which I give you a part of it, and from the side of Carhe and Edessa, there was a battle with Caesar Valerian, and I, by my own hands, caught the Caesar Valerian. What else is there in this cube of Zoroaster? Well, here's the inscription, so I've taken part of the inscription from the cube. And here is the uh, rock relief. But there's also the image of this gentleman, this Zoroastrian priest named Kerdir. He's a fascinating character who's left us here two inscriptions uh, of what is Zoroastrianism and his journey to heaven, hell, and what he calls this purgatory, Hamistagon. It's one of at least the earliest uh, inscribed uh, testament of journey, uh, sort of out of body journey, or Mehraj if you want to uh, talk about a pre-Mehraj literature uh, series. Uh, that is not all that exists at the sacred mountain. Uh, there are fire altars on the back of mountain. There are actually fire receptacles, I mean, astudans or receptacles where bones of important personages were made. So this mountain, I just want you to realize that's quite important. I think in this way, the Iranians of antiquity seem to have decided to place in one sacred location their history in pictures and texts for prosperity. Uh, at the Kuhnevesh, the mountain of, or, uh, of archives of writing, Obviously, any damage to it would be an immense loss. There was recently a project of actually a railroad that even its vibration had damaged, uh, was going to damage the site, let alone imagine if there were bombs uh, being uh, fallen anywhere close by. Uh, I would end uh, by words of wisdom, perhaps, from Darius I from the sixth century, where on his Persepolis inscription, he has this passage. If you shall look at this inscription or these sculptures and shall destroy them and shall not, as long as there is strength to you, care for them, may Ahura Mazda be your destroyer. And may offspring not be to you, and what you shall do, may Ahura Mazda let that go wrong for you. Thank you. <laughs>